Brian Rucker. Welcome. Rucker is well known for his lively presentations that are often delivered in full pioneer garb. He has authored and edited dozens of books and articles related to West Florida history and was the 20, 2017 president of the Gulf South Historical Association. A PSC alum, Rucker earned bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of West Florida and a doctoral degree from Florida State University. He joined the PSC faculty in 1996 and is a member of the college's prestigious Academy of Teaching Excellence. Sometimes if they got log glue, you fasten this end of the dog to one log, this one another log. And you might have a single file chain of logs two or three miles long. They would also put rafts together and, and fasten them together. And speaking of which, I told some students one time, said, well, you went to the dentist back in the day. <laughs> I said, no, I said, no, no. Um, this is not a drill for this. But this was utilized in the logging industry. If they're building a raft, they would often bore through, cut through a log, and then take a sapling and then use that as a tie together and create log rafts that way. So this was very essential in the logging industry, especially on the rivers, on the rivers and bays around here. And later on. After the big trees had been cut down, the turpentine industry was big. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is waste not, what not. When the turpentine tree finally ended up dead, they would drill into the base. It's also the same diameter of a stick of dynamite. 
So they put the stick of dynamite right there, blow the stuff out, and then they would carry off that stuff, which is saturated with uh, turpentine and, and sap and tar to the different places that would process them, like at Gold Point and other areas. So very useful, not just in the log industry, but in the turpentine industry. Let's see what else. Uh, a homemade saw. Now, you know, everything was homemade. You can see where this has just been put, put together. And, you know, on the frontier, you didn't really have many trips to the hardware store. There's no Lowe's. Mm -hmm. And people would make what they did. It's basically, it's a good saw for taking off limbs and things of this nature. Uh, I had a crosscut saw, but it was too difficult to bring. What's interesting, at the Arcadia Museum, when Ivan came through, there was so much, so many trees down, they were blocked in. The, and the caretaker at the time got the crosscut saw that was on the wall on the display of the museum. And they went out and they cut their way out using the museum piece. Wow. And I thought that was great. It got the rust off of it. And, <laughs> but we're using museum artifacts to get your way out. Wow. Let's see what else. Oh, speaking of turpentine. For years, I thought this was a bail bucket when I went fishing with my grandparents and all that. But I found out years later, this is what they would put underneath a pine tree to catch the sap once they, And I forgot to bring my chipper, which we actually would use to cut. And they would drip the turpentine into this every couple of days. They would take the dippings, put it in a barrel, take it to a still, and turn it into turpentine and pitch. And for wooden ships, Pitch and turpentine was important. Every ship that had, was a wooden ship had barrels of this out there in their ship in case it got a leak. Wooden ships are not watertight. And that's something that's been going on for thousands of years. So this is what they would catch it in. We just use it as a bail bucket. <laughs> turpentine was rough. Uh, each person that ran the turpentine industry would basically do six to 8,000 pine trees a week. Wow. With the chippers, you know, either he was chipping, he was dipping, or whatever. It was brutal. It was brutal. And this looks like a lethal weapon. It actually probably is. This is, this is a stripper. Well, my students said, damn, I like my girlfriend. <laughs> when you cut down sugar cane. To get the outside layer off, you hold it down and you pull this, it rips the outside layer, get it down to the exposed sugar cane. So during the fall, people will be out there in the fields stripping off the sugar cane. And this was something that my grandparents, great grandparents used. Let's see what else. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you say, oh, that's a trap. It's even got the brand. The Victor, you know, like Victor mousetraps. They've been around a while. Um, let me show you how it works. Do I have a volunteer? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This actually was used by my grandfather fairly late in the 1920s when he was a kid. And the reason they were using it in the 20s, I mean, they used traps to, you know, augment their, their food supply, stuff like this, but he usually used it to catch raccoons. The 20s. Raccoon skin coats were all the rage oh. for flapper men. I mean, you look, and these things went from your chin down to your ankles. If you look at old film clips of college football games in the 20s, half the people in the bleachers look like they're bears. They got these, so the population of raccoons took a big hit in the 20s. Everybody's processing raccoons. And what's interesting, raccoons are victims of fashion. They got hit in the 20s, and then, 1955, bam! Daniel Crockett. Yeah. Davy Crockett came Daniel on TV. Crockett. Every kid in America had to have a Davy Crockett yeah. raccoon skin coat. And I just keep waiting for the next thing. Lady Gaga's going to have raccoon skin panties, and that's going to be the next thing. <laughs> so poor raccoons, victims of fashion. So what else do we have? Well, on the frontier, you had to be constantly vigilant because you have four-legged critters, you have two-legged critters like hostile Indians, uh, bandits, highwaymen, in-laws. <laughs> Everybody was prepared. Every man, woman, and child knew how to uh, shoot a gun and use a knife. And they would often use these hatchets. 
This is something they borrowed from the Native Americans. Native Americans used these a lot. It was a useful tool, and if you know, caught out there in the open, it could be a weapon. It's light, it's easy to use. The old days, people had the, the muskets where you have to put the powder horn, and they would use a cow horn for the powder horn, and if they're really smart, they get the tip of a cow horn and measure the exact amount of powder they needed for the charge. So they pour that in there, pour that into the gun, and had it done. Then, along came new technology. In 1857, Colt revolving carbine. Wow. And this was one of the most coolest things of that age. And out there in the boonies where there's panthers and there's bears, oh my, this would be very useful. And so this was, you know, this would be very expensive, but if you live on the frontier and, you know, it took like, if you're lucky, 40 seconds to load an old, you know, type of uh, uh, barrel with the, the shot and the powder, but this one you could get off six shots pretty easily. This is the revolution technology. Is it for sale? Uh, it is not real because I could retire if it was a real one. Oh, okay. This is uh, just a replica. Okay. I think that I call, I, I did hear that one was selling for thirty-five thousand. Wow. Like, uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah. My pennies don't add up that much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the whip. Now the whip was an essential thing. This is how we get the term Florida crackers. A lot of people that came down from Georgia and Alabama that settled on the Florida frontier were hunters and drovers. They basically drove cattle and hogs. And they were cattlemen. They were cowboys. They don't like to be called cowboys. They're called in Florida cow hunters. And keep in mind, Florida is still the largest beef producing state east of the Mississippi. There is a thriving industry. And so a lot of times they would crack the whips running the cows and they would communicate with each other. Three sharp cracks, bam, 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 I'm in trouble, SOS. It was a signal. So you could hear all these whip crackers down there in the swamps with their, with their cattle. And so that became a, a code and that's how you got the term crackers. A lot of people think it's a, you know, a terrible insult, but you know, it's part of our frontier heritage. It didn't matter the color of your skin. You could be black or white, it was a cracker lifestyle. Whether the architecture, the frontier, the food, it did not matter. Um, when you're raising the cattle, you would register your brand at the courthouse, and people had different brands, and they, you know, if there was a question, you just go to the courthouse and say, look it up. Um, they did not brand hogs. That's called uh, barbecue. Uh, but they, they would cut out notches in the ears of the hogs and in certain designs, and they would register those as their sort of like their copyright insignia at the courthouse as well. And so you had a lot of people who looked really poor and had these little homesteads, but they might have, you know, 2,000 cattle that were free ranging between Gulf Breeze and Choctahatchee Bay, mm -hmm. and, and, and hogs as well. So just because they look like a, a, they're very primitive, they might have some serious money on the hoof, literally. And the whip was a very essential part of it. Uh, I, when I first bought a whip, the people said, you need to practice. You need to put like, some safety goggles on and put leather gloves on. I said, I don't need that. <laughs> I went outside, bang, ah! ah! <laughs> There's a reason they warn you about things. Do not think you can just automatically do it. Now, I'm pretty good at it now, but I remember well, I was stupid. And so you learn, you live and you learn. Um, I have shown this to my students in class before, and I, I did want, of course, we could do it now because if the ceiling tiles were lower then I popped out ceiling tiles, oh my God. Uh. But I took them out during the break, it was a night class, and I showed, you know, I got it out, and I popped the whip. It sounds like a 22 rifle going off. Because what you're doing, when you're actually popping the whip, you're breaking the sound barrier. That's what creates the noise. And when it popped off, bam, like that, within five minutes, the UWF police came up. They said, somebody got a gun? No, no guns here. So I don't do that anymore, good gracious. But to see an expert, 
These guys, these cow hunters, these cracker pioneer Florida people, they would be on a horse. And you, a horse would train. You said, doesn't the horse get scared when they hear the pop? No. When you get a colt, you start popping the whip around it, it gets used to it. And when they hear the whoosh, they know the pop is coming. And so you can actually see the horses close their ears. Their ears will go like this. They also do this when they're going across a river. They cut, they're basically close their ears. So they know the sound's coming and they'll close their ears. They get used to it. So that's why the horses are affected. You also have a cur dog which came from the word curtail, to keep and to corner. A cur dog is a dog trained with the cow hunter and the horse to basically keep the cattle going the right direction or pull specific cows out. And I saw a guy a few years ago, it was amazing. He worked with the dog, whistled over there, pointed here, cracked the whip, pointed that cow, and the, the, the dog would cur up, curtail it, and bring it over and separate it. Then, I was impressed with that. And then, he dropped the reins of his horse. He's doing nothing, he's not controlling the horse at all. He whistles, points over to one of the cows in the herd. The dog and the horse working together. He's just sitting there. The dog and the horse go out there and pull that cow out of the herd and separate it. It was so cool to see the synergy between you know, a horse a, a, a man and, and a dog. It was really cool. So there's almost an art to it. Well, you know, these are some of the, the artifacts from the, the frontier. And first of all, about the, the Piney Woods frontier, let me say right off the bat, oh, I forgot to mention my jacket. Now, you see, you got fringes, you country western singer. <laughs> now, the fringes actually serve a practical purpose. A lot of times you're out there in the elements 24-7. If it rains on you, the fringes allow the water to drip off and drain your clothing faster than without the fringes. It's a gutter system. So that's an extra served a practical purpose. Today it's just decoration for country western singers, but back then it served a practical purpose. That was the reason for it. We tend to romanticize the frontier. You, see, you think of a little log cabin out there in the middle of nowhere and, and you know, a little bit of smoke coming up. It's so idyllic, but every day was a struggle for survival. Like I said, you had to worry about four-legged varmints. You had to worry about two-legged varmints. And around here, you had to worry about you know, slithering varmints, snakes and alligators. But, uh, um, but it was a wild environment. There were bears, there were panthers, there were wolves that can do damage to your livestock and give the opportunity to you set yourself as well. Now since you're in Gold Breach, you know all about bears. Yep. Oh my goodness, bears are everywhere. I got the same problem. People say, does a bear poop in the woods? No, it poops in my driveway. Right. You know, 3.30 the other afternoon, I'm looking out my window, there's a bear looking at me. He's like, get out! He ran off, but you know, good grief. And anyhow, we've always had bear problems. One of the founders of the Fort Walton area back in the 1830s had to burn bonfires out at night to keep the bears away. Sometimes they brought their livestock into the cabin with them for protection. The guy kept a journal and killed 52 bears in the course of a year. That's an average of a bear a week. He wrote, there's no appreciable decline in the bear population. He had not made a dent friend of mine over in North Walton County, a lot of bears there, and they said that uh, they heard noise one night, they got up in the middle of the night and in the kitchen and a bear had crawled through the window, was going through their pantry and their refrigerator. I said, what'd you do? Well, I said, it would take him too long, you know, to get anybody to come out and, you know, we just uh, shut the door, locked it, put Chester drawers around and went back to bed. <laughs> you went back to bed with a bear in your kitchen. I don't think I could have done that. But then I guess if you live in North Walton County, anything's possible. Uh, it's, it's still the frontier there. Still the frontier. Anyhow, you know, we're talking about you know, the lifestyles. Here's what would happen. A frontier family would find a nice piece of land, you know, 10, 20 acres, and they cut down every tree on it. And they would put a little log cabin right in the middle of this 20-acre plot. 
And they did not remove the stumps. Back then, you did not have dynamite. You did not have root be gone. It was too labor intensive to really uh, try to get the stumps up. So when you came across one of these frontier homesteads, you saw a log cabin. It looks like cut over forest land, and they would plant little patches of pumpkins and squash and <coughs> potatoes and corn between the stumps. When I mean, you think of a farm being the nice neat rose, nothing like that. It was just cut over forest land with little pieces of, of crops going here and there. Now over the years, as the stumps rotted out, they would finally pull them out and you put in straight rows like a normal farm. But in the early years, it looked nothing like that. And the log cabin was the easiest thing to build. If you ever played with Lincoln Logs as a kid, you know the basics. And a large family could build a log cabin half, half the size of this room in about a day. You know, put one here, one there, and, um, and then you chink it with mud or clay. But of course, when it got hot, you just knock the chinking out during the summer and let the wind come through, cross ventilation. The easiest way to build a log cabin is with a dirt floor. <coughs> now the problem is it's a dirt floor. And you know, it's claiming we get up at night and, uh, and, and snakes and, and bugs come in and, and <coughs> heaven help you if you're OCD and like to sweep. Oh my gosh, you know, and that's it, you have a dirt floor. But a lot of times in this area, they put a little extra expense and put the log cabin up on blocks, on stumps or piles of bricks, what have you, maybe two to three feet above the ground. And you notice there are a lot of houses around here, old houses, they're still up on blocks. That's because those houses were built before air conditioning became prominent. Today you have slab construction, but back then, they realized if they had the place elevated, you get a cross flow ventilation that would come through. And, and it was pretty, you know, pretty savvy. They figured out, you know, get a shade tree, have a southern exposure, and have plenty of shades and porches, and have, you know, some cross flow ventilation. So it was a pretty primitive thing, but it worked. And they also would have uh, an outhouse, a smokehouse, a barn, chicken coops around there. If you came across one of these places, you never came un unannounced because they usually had like 30 dogs. The dogs were trained for different purposes. They're wolf dogs, bear dogs, coon dogs, uh, whatever. But let's say the man in the house was out with the dogs. They're, they're out you know, looking for the cow or something. You still never came up unannounced because they always had geese. A goose is a good watchdog. If you've got more than one goose, it's even worse. And if, if you know people with geese and you come up to visit them, you know what goes on. The goose will rah, 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 rah. thank you. They will come right up to you and never turn your back on a goose. Mm -hmm. Because they will get down low and they'll run at you and they will goose you. <laughs> they know where the soft meat is. They love the part right behind the knees. So remember, you're a, you're a human being adult. You are more intelligent than a goose, I hope. <laughs> well, my students, I can't say that. <laughs> but if you're confronted with a goose, he's like, oh, oh, okay, I'm a human being. I'm an intelligent person. I'm not afraid of you. A little bit, yes, but never show fear. You look at the goose, and if you want to leave, you walk backwards. Always keeping eye contact with the goose. Never take eye contact off the goose. Now, if another goose comes up behind you, all bets are off. <laughs> then you run, then you run. Now they would have a milk cow, some goats, maybe a pig for snake protection. A pig will eat anything. And a lot of times, just like people in India will have a mongoose to protect against cobra, uh, people in the, the frontier areas would often keep a pig around to protect against snake. A, a, a hog will see a snake and immediately just go and start pulling it apart and ripping it up. And, we'll, and, we'll, and that's it. Now a snake will also be prey to, a small snake, to a cat. Cats are really good. Uh, a cat will hypnotize. They'll charm a snake. And you, you, you know, you like, you see the old movies where there's a snake charmer. It's not the music, it's the swaying motion. And a cat will do this. If you ever see, it's really amazing. A cat will find a snake and start doing this. 
and the snake like, oh. <laughs> and the cat is completely charmed, hypnotized, mesmerized. And, and then the cat will go, don't, oh no, I can't run away because I have no legs. And then it goes in for the kill and drags up the snake and says, look what I did. Oh, thank you, Fluffy. Uh, but to see it actually happen is pretty cool. So let's see, what else do we have on the farm from, oh, guineas. They even had ducks and geese, but they also had guineas. A guinea is like a giant quail-like bird, about yay big. They use them for meat and for eggs. Most godforsaken animal in the world. Because they go, <laughs> all day, all night long. My neighbors have guineas. They like to come up under our bedroom window at 6 o'clock in the morning and do that. They're disgusting animals. And oh, you would also see, this may surprise you, you would see peacocks or peahens. It sounds like somebody, well, a lot of times they were on frontier homesteads. It was a good supply of meat and eggs. But peacocks are also highly overrated. Years ago, a peacock came up, and nobody knew where it came from. Nobody claimed it. I made the mistake of feeding the peacock. It wouldn't leave. It would roost in a tree in the backyard. When I came out in the morning, there was a pile of dung that high. I said, oh my gosh, that came out of you? And when I would go down the trail, he would fly and follow me. And when they fly, they grunt. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> it was even worse when mating season came. They sound like a woman being brutally murdered slowly. Ah, and people will call the police. Somebody's been killed next door. And they come, what's that? Nah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and when they do that little NBC thing, you know, do, 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 the plumage, that's very aggressive behavior, too. I learned that the hard way. Had my little boy, he was about two years old, and pulled the little red wagon through the yard. That peacock strutting around, came over there and started pecking him on the head. I said, oh, no, you, days are over. And I did find out they are delicious. <laughs> I was going to get rid of them, though. And I knew some stupid people, I mean friends of mine, that wanted a peacock. I said, come on up. He is yours. And they're about five or six. Oh, what a beautiful animal. You have him. And so, I wish I had filmed this. And the guy in a circle around the peacock. It got closer and closer. Oh my gosh. And then, boom, he went up in a tree. It flew! <laughs> yeah, it's not an ostrich, it's not a penguin. It, they can fly. It just took like five, I didn't know they could fly. It took like five minutes to just wrap their head around that one. They chased that thing for 45 minutes. <laughs> Never got close. They gave up. I said, you give up? I said, oh, no, we'll come back next week. We got an idea. So next week they came and they brought a huge cage made out of chicken wire. And it's a little trap door. And in the cage, they had borrowed someone's pee hen. They put out there a little pee hen. And the peacock, ooh, baby. <laughs> Five minutes later, bam, he was called. Sex gets him every time. <laughs> wow. Everything on the frontier was homemade. You, you made your own medicine. You made your own food. Everything was homemade. It's like some of these things here. You know, the nearest place might be 20 miles away. And if you got sick, there's two options. You got well or you died. And the nearest town might be, like I said, 20 miles away. And the doctor is probably a quack. A lot of people use herbal remedies. They learned from, uh, like, uh, well, especially from Native Americans who realized which bark, which root, which thing actually cured what. Now, my great grandmother used to tell me about how that if somebody had stomach problems, you make briar root tea. I said, that's stupid. No wise tale. I found out years later that uh, briar roots have the same ingredients that caked up chaopectic and pepto -bismol. They didn't know why it worked. They just knew it worked. It was green herbal medicine. They were smart people. And uh, the community was important. Sometimes you saw a total of 35 different human beings in the course of a year. Wrap your head around that. 
From next year, all you will see are 35 different human beings. Because you know, it might be five miles to your next door neighbor on the frontier. So community was so important. That's why if somebody's barn burned down, everybody showed up and had a barn raising. And you better show up because if you don't, people say, oh, he didn't show up. So if something happened to you, nobody will come help you. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. The community was important. One of the things they did, they had, uh, the men would go off on two-week hunting and fishing trips. This still goes on. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, they did not always come back alive or whole because they also brought with them enormous amounts of whiskey. <laughs> oh, by the way, this still goes on too. <laughs> you know, sometimes you, you hear about a, a Scambia County native um, you know, was fishing and uh, ended up drowning in the bay. They never tell you that when they found the boat, he fell out of, there were 18 empty beer cans in the bottom of the boat. Usually alcohol is a contributing factor. Now, the women would have quilting bees. And quilts, as we know, even in Florida, it gets cold. And quilts, though, are laborious, they're time consuming to make. But many hands make light work. So, the women would meet several times a month at a designated homestead, and they work on that person's quilt. And after it was done, they work on another person's quilt, and get a cycle through the neighborhood. And it was a chance for women to gossip and socialize and drink enormous amounts of whiskey. <laughs> the alcoholism was rampant on the frontier. There were babies weaned on moonshine. And we know those quilting bees, those women were plastered because some of those frontier quilts have survived. <laughs> Nothing is lined up correctly. It's like, whatever. <laughs> you know? They are snookered. Oh my goodness. Uh, another thing you have sadly is a lot of violence on the frontier because it was a violent world it, you know eat or be eaten it was a, survival was important uh, the you know, the recall might knock a five-year-old backward from firing the musket but it might save the family from a, a hostile animal attack or something like that because th there was so much violence on the frontier you had to be very careful and what we have this today is a relic of this is what they call Southern hospitality. Where you say, yes ma'am, yes sir, you open the door for people, you all sit down and kick it off your shoes, you call, come back now, yeah. yeah. That is what we call Southern hospitality. You're genteel and nice to people. It actually should be frontier hospitality. You're nice to people so they wouldn't kill you. Because if somebody's at the general store and they're telling a story, you're just thinking they're like, yeah, whatever. You have inadvertently dissed them and they're stabbing you because you have insulted them. you got to be careful. You just say, yes, sir, uh-huh, yes, sir. You think they're still lying, but you just agree, uh-huh, yes, sir, understand, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, if you're an isolated homesteader and this stranger rides up on horseback you've never seen before, you invite him in for supper. Hey, stranger, come on. Hey, why don't you spend the night? Why do you do this? Because he might be a psychopathic lunatic. It would be nice to get him on his good side. Be nice to him. You know, there are a lot of criminal and mentally ill people on the frontier. It was a safety valve for the big cities. People would escape the big cities. You know, there's less law and order. You can do your own thing. And it's still that way. Have you been to Montana lately? It's wild out there. But, you know, this was the Wild West, too. So you had to be careful. And so it's good to get on their good side. And this is not bad philosophy. When you go into Target, you know, and, and somebody whips into the parking place you were going to get, and you flip them off, and then they pull out an Uzi, was it really worth it? Let it go. Let it go. Be calm. Serenity now. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, um, there were some people on the frontier you didn't even say yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am, too, because you just stayed away from them. They would fight for any excuse at all. I call these people Hell's Angels and Buckskin. And they would get, usually it was, they were drinking and they'd get insulted with you. And they would, they would start out with a monologue of what they're gonna do to you. If you're smart, this is where you start wandering off and, and run. But it was like this you know, monologue, and we actually have a sample of this. 
cold on there. And I knew it's here somewhere. It's hiding. Well, I thought I had it. Ah, here we go. Bunch of keel boatmen coming down the river. They stopped for the night, start drinking. One guy jumped up and started singing, apparently not well cooked here too in a bucket. And one of the people that was with him said this quote, What the hell you call that? Can't you say nothing pretty, you dash dash egg sucking, sheep stealing, one eyed son of a stuffed monkey? This was considering an insult. <laughs> and then the person responded by jumping up, clicking up his heels again, Woo! I'm the old original iron jaw brass mounted copper belly colts maker for the wilds of Arkansas. You dare to insult me? Don't even attempt to look at me with a naked eye, gentlemen. Contemplate me through leather. Don't use a naked eye. I'm the man with a petrified heart and bore arm bowels. The great American desert is my enclosed property, and I'll bury my dead on my own prison and eat them up for babies. Woo! Bow your neck and spread for the pet child clan that's coming. You! Now today we call these professional wrestlers. <laughs> it's almost the same thing. And then they started the fight and it got bad, you know. Uh, eye gouging was really nasty. You use these two fingers, a thumb, grabbing, trying to, oh, uh, yeah, nasty. Um, and you said, did everybody fight like that? There, there were politicians and lawyers and doctors, decent people. If they got insulted, they would just challenge you to a duel. That's so much more civilized. And you know, politicians making a speech, and you're like, what? Well, yeah, yeah. Are you saying I'm lying? Where your lips are moving, aren't they? And then he takes off his glove, come down there, slaps you in the face. Sir, you insulted the honor of my good name, the honor of my family. I demand satisfaction in the field of honor tomorrow morning. You know? What the heck is honor? But the frontier was filled with this highly inflated sense of honor that the least thing you know, was an insult. We haven't really progressed very far from that, have we? You looked at social media like, <laughs> good grief. And so then, if, of course, if you do the smart thing, is I'm not going to get involved. Then everybody's like, oh, wuss, 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 you, your honor's at stake. I mean, Alexander Hamilton was killed in a duel. Andrew Jackson had numerous duels. He had a bullet next to his heart for the rest of his life. And it was bad. Mark Twain once said, if he was ever challenged to a duel, he said, yeah, sure. Cannon, 10 paces. They had a place they sent people outside the town to do it. In Pensacola, it was Frascati, which is next to the Salt Marsh Steakhouse by the Graffiti Bridge, that little area through there. Take it outside, boys. And you know, there, were, there were duels to the death, really big personal grudges, sometimes first blood. Yeah, people got killed, people got, but if you start looking at the statistics, about 80% of them involved with no injuries. Because you get up in a beautiful morning, oh yeah, I gotta find a duel. And you don't feel as insulted. But you gotta go through it. So you go there to the designated area, choose your weapon, and you talk to the person that you insulted. You know, I'm really sorry about what I said to you yesterday. Thank you. We gotta go through with this. Yeah, but I just wanna let you know I really am deeply, <laughs> tragically sorrowful. And you just hope they're getting the drift. And then they take their weapons and go 10 paces, turn around, open fire, and birds in another county would fall over dead. All these people are such good shots, can hit anything. Has your honor been avenged? It has. I buy you a beer. That's how most of them ended, thankfully. He also had, you know, like the Hatfields McCoys, you had family feuds. This popular game show. No. It, the Hatfields McCoys are nothing. They had families around here that would just attack each other for 30, 40 years. They didn't even know why. Because Grandpa Smith's goat got Grandpa Jones' tater patch 35 years ago. They didn't even know why they're fighting. Now, you said, well, this is a pretty rough world. It was. But we got some interesting language out of it. For instance, your old stomping grounds. Now, you go back to your old school, your old neighborhood. That was a horse corral where the horse's home turf was. It stomped around them. On the frontier, you never carry anything. You towed it. I'm going to tow the sack of taters. You never yelled at someone. You hollered at them. Something we still use in the South, I'm fixing to. 
which is Old English, perfectly acceptable in the preparation of. You never uh, won a contest, you whip someone, or whoop them, or open up a can of whoop ass on them. If somebody said, a severe dog is behind you. You said, a severe dog? That meant a wild, possibly rabid, foam in the mouth dog is behind you, run. So stuff from the steamboat era to let off steam, to be in a tight place, to tie to, cut loose. A person might be lambasted. You might work from sun up to sundown. He took a licking. I'm going to mose him down to the store. Well, aren't you persnickety? I'm going to, you never threw anything, you chunk it. I'm going to chunk a dirt claw at you. A person might be rip roared or rambunctious or highfalutin. Well, tarnation. Euphemisms were everywhere. If you had a bad child, they said, that was a boatload of earthquake. <laughs> Ever heard the expression that they got the dirty in the stick, the dirty into the deal? It was a lumberjack contest from the frontier period. You took a big log, put a deal, small piece of lumber or a stick underneath it. One person grabbed one end, one grabbed the other. They tried to drag this log, and the first person let go loses. Unscrupulous opponents before the contest would take the stick or the deal and stick it into a cow patty another euphemism, and slide the dirty end of the stick over to their opponent. It's slippery, they can't get a good grip here, they're going to lose the contest. One person described Florida, they love exaggeration. Florida is the most fertile land I ever saw. The land produces 40 bushels of frogs to an acre and alligators enough to fence them. You know, we've lost something there. I, I love to just, you know, the, the, the exoticness of some of that language. One of my favorite expressions, man, it's darker than the inside of a cow. She was as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Mm -hmm. Their land was so poor they couldn't even raise a fuss on it. And I'll conclude tonight by, well, uh, people were afraid of snakes. There were a lot of snakes back then. Washington County, near the mouth of the Choctaw River, 1830s, a tax collector or assessor was going from place to place out in the middle of the boonies of the Choctahatchee Swamp. Little homestead, log cabin with a dirt floor. Sun started to go down. It, it, there's no way he can get back to civilization. He says, you know, I hate to impose on Is there a way I can stay with you tonight? And the settler says, sure, come on in, you know, and you know, I will get your cot set up. That'll be no problem. So they brought in a little cot for him and then he knows the settler is bringing in his cows and his, his chickens and his goat and his hog. What are you doing? Oh, it's not safe out there. That's for protection. <laughs> and the guy sitting there on the cot, he notices on the exposed rafters of the log cabin, there's dozens of things nailed up there. He said, what are those? Oh, rattles and buttons. See that one? Eight rattles and a butt off that rattlesnake, killed that one about three days ago right in that corner there. And that one, six rattles one, killed that by the front door. They're everywhere. Sometimes they do come in at night, so I won't get up. Good night. <laughs> they come in at night. Guys like laying there in the fetal position on this cot. I'm not going to sleep. And all the animals are moving around. Well, about an hour later, it starts to get drowsy. Start stretching, he felt something move at the end of the cot. He just knew it was a slither. He started to pull his foot back. Ah! On his ankle! Oh! And the guy got the lamp lit, the, and the, the settler and the wife was like, what's going on? I, I mean, oh, and there, there are fang marks there on his ankle. And so where is it? They look at all the animals. Everything's just in a mess. And he must have gone back out. Well, where are you going, Doug? I bet. Yeah, you did. Where are you going sucking it? Oh, I don't suck. But what are you going to do? You need to purge the poison. You need to purge it. Well, what's that? So they made some Yopon tea. If you make it, it's really high in caffeine. If you make it the right dosage, it will basically make you throw up and purge the poison from your system. So they found this Yopon tea, and he threw up for three hours trying to get the poison out of the system. Well, three hours later, he does not look good. But he's alive. And the, the settler said, you know, if you're going to be dead, you're probably dead by now. I think you're going to pull through okay. Let's go to A guy staggers back to the cot, gets into the cot, and there at the end of the cot is a rooster, and the rooster went, 
The rooster has spurs. It made identical fang marks to the other ankle. No! <laughs> Say, oh my gosh, it not been a snake, he just been spurred by a stupid rooster. So even when snakes weren't around, they're causing people grief. Now see, when I first ran across this account, I'm thinking the settler probably knew it was a rooster. <laughs> Why? You know, you got the tax collector, the tax assessor there. Let's make him suffer a little. <laughs> That's my own gut feeling about that one. But welcome to the frontier, folks. It was a wild, woolly time. Thank you for your time. See you next.